Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Paper Magician by Charlie N. Holmberg. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so that you'll be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support BBC, you can do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. One, you can become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So, without further ado, let's continue. The Paper Magician, Chapter 3 Sienny, with Pip's daring escape tucked under her arm, picked up a few snowflakes herself until Jonto showed up at the door. Still somewhat unnerved by a live skeleton, regardless of its docile and papyric constitution, Sienny excused herself. She stowed one of the smallest snowflakes into her skirt pocket to take with her, for studying. Magician Thane had already vanished into his bedroom, so Sienny vanished into hers as well. She set the book and her hat on the table, then hefted her suitcase onto the bed, beside the beige cape line hat that she had brought with her. The latches on the suitcase opened with two clicks. Her green student's apron lay on top, a last-minute packing decision, just in case she needed it. She set it aside and pulled out her blouses and skirts, shaking each in an attempt to unwrinkle the fabric. Fortunately, the paper magician had remembered hangers in the closet. Sienny took her time hanging up each item of clothing. She paused on the last skirt, her thoughts shifting from where on earth she would stow her underthings and pistol to the revelation about her scholarship. Fifteen thousand pounds! Where would she be today if not for that money? Scrubbing some aristocrat's floor, hoping she had saved enough to enroll in cooking classes? And why had Magician Thane given the money to her in the first place? She'd never met him before today. She would have remembered. The scholarship had no title, no recurrences. Sienny couldn't believe she had merely been filtered through and selected due to a good grades for a one-time donation, as he seemed to imply. Had she? What sort of man was Magician Emery Thane to donate such a large sum to a complete stranger, and one he didn't even request for apprenticeship? As Sienny returned to her suitcase, she began to wonder just how much a magician made. It must be a grand sum, unless Magician Thane hoarded money the way he seemed to hoard all the other knickknacks in the house. Sienny hoped for the grand sum. She would feel terribly guilty otherwise. Perhaps it would be better not to pry, but he couldn't stop her from thinking on it. For now, though, she'd put it aside and focus on the task at hand. She reached inside of her suitcase, filled now with her makeup, barrettes, journal, and a library card that would do her no good here, so far away from any library that she knew, when again her thoughts took a turn. Her hand went to the turquoise dog collar wedged in the corner beneath her underthings. She held it up, running a thumb over its frayed ends, worn from too much chewing. She had taken Busy's tag off yesterday and given it to her mother, who now looked after the Jack Russell Terrier in Sienny's stead. Sienny sighed. That dog had been her dearest friend through the last few years, especially at the Tagus Praff School for the Magically Inclined. One couldn't make much in the way of friends at that school if they wanted to graduate in the designated year. There was simply too much work to do. But Busy didn't have homework, and she always waited eagerly by the dorm room door for Sienny to return after classes every day. That made her the best kind of friend. You have a dog? Or a very large cat? Sienny's heart skipped a beat and she whirled around, slamming her suitcase shut to hide her underthings and gun. Magician Thane stood in the doorway, not yet breaching the threshold into the bedroom, holding a rather large stack of books. She should have closed that door. Sienny clasped the collar. Had one. She lived with me at the school, but Magician Avioski told me I couldn't bring her here because of your allergies. Magician Thane nodded slowly, his bright eyes thoughtful. "'I never was good around animals, even as a boy,' he said, in agreement. "'I preferred bees.' "'Bees?' Sienny asked. 
He looked at her as though the preference was entirely normal, and she was strange for questioning it. And, as he seemed to want to do, he didn't respond more than that. "'May I come in?' he asked. Sienny nodded. Kicking the door open with his toe, Magician Thane stepped into the room and set the stack of books down on the desk. Sienny cringed. She had worried those would be for her. "'Some reading for when Pip tires you,' Magician Thane said, patting the top of the stack with his hand. Arching sideways, Sienny read the titles. Astrology for Youth, Anatomy of the Human Body, Volume 1, Marcus Waters' Guide to Pyrotechnics, Theories on Aviation, and Calming the Spirits, an Essay on the Tau. Sienny's lips parted a little wider with each title. But these have nothing to do with paper, she said. Hmm, I can see why they accepted you at Tagus Praff, he said with a chuckle. Sienny glared at him, but he went on, nonchalant. Paper is more than just trees run through a chipper, Sienny. These will benefit you for future lessons. He tapped his chin and glanced to the window. Are you hungry? She set Busy's collar down. Not especially. I ate in the buggy. I'll leave something on the stove for you, then, he replied, walking back into the hallway. Do get some rest, he called, even as his voice faded away. I have a busy day planned for you tomorrow. We don't want to let that Tagus Praff work ethic go to waste. Sienny glanced to the books on her desk, wondering just what sort of work the paper magician had in store for her. She had heard that many magicians forced their apprentices to do physical labor for their first year to humble them, or perhaps to break them. Sienny prayed that wouldn't be the case here, although she wouldn't be surprised if Magician Thane planned to break her mentally first, what with the thickness of those volumes. At least she could be confident that weeding would not be one of her chores. She hadn't seen a single real flower in the front gardens. Sienny unpacked the rest of her things, putting her makeup, barrettes, journal, and Busy's collar on the shelves carved into the wall beside the bed. She decided to keep her underthings and pistol in her suitcase, which she shoved beneath the bed. Outside, the sun made its slow descent to the west. Sienny would have to see to getting a clock in her room if Magician Thane granted her any wages. She would have to ask about that in the morning. Sitting on her mattress, Sienny cracked open the well-worn binding of Astrology for Youth and skimmed the first four chapters, then browsed through the figures in Anatomy of the Human Body, reading the captions beneath images of lungs, kidneys, hearts, and livers lying back on her pillow with theories of aviation on her stomach. Sienny pondered paper snow until she drifted into a hazy slumber, where she dreamed of enchanted cannons and the other spells she would have learned had Magician Evioski only let her become a smelter. Sienny awoke with a start, though she could not remember why. Perhaps she'd dreamed of falling, a nightmare she had at least once every week since the age of eleven, when she had toppled off a dapple mare in her uncle's cousin's backyard. The sun had disappeared entirely from her window. If she pressed her face against the glass, she could spy the tips of the three-quarter moon above her. It was late. Indeed, perhaps an hour past midnight. Stomach growling, Sienny blinked sleep from her eyes, stood and adjusted her skirt, which had turned about her sideways. She also rebraided her hair over her left ear, for it surely looked a mess, not that anyone would be up to see it. Not that anyone lived in the cottage but Magician Thane and his animated skeleton butler. After making her way down to the kitchen by candlelight, it felt very strange to wander a place entirely dark as Tagus Praff always had those new electric bulbs lighting the hallways, or a fire magician keeping lanterns lit. Sienny found a saucepan and bowl sitting atop the stove. The saucepan held half-stale rice, and the bowl had been filled with what looked like some form of preserved tuna. She shook her head. Was this what Magician Thane ate normally, or was this what he served to guests? For if rice and tuna was his for guests meal, Sienny couldn't imagine what the man ate when he dined alone. Perhaps Magician Avioski had assigned her here merely to ensure England's oddest paper magician got some decent nutrition and didn't wither away, leaving the country with only eleven paper magicians instead of twelve. 
Sienny would have to inspect the cupboards tomorrow to see what magician Thane had stocked. For now, however, she found a bowl and scooped up some cold rice, but left the tuna. She took two steps back toward the room when she heard something subtle. A drawer closing, perhaps. Curious, Sienny shoved a spoonful of rice into her mouth and tiptoed through the dining room and kitchen before spying a line of light coming from the hallway. The door on the left, her right specifically, the study. Sienny fed herself another spoonful. What sorts of hobbies did this man keep to be awake so late? The idea of him meddling with the dark arts almost made her laugh, but a good swallow prevented that. Sienny had a hard time imagining Magician Thane, regardless of his level of madness, dabbling in a shadow work or excision, the forbidden magic that used human flesh as a conduit. A shiver crept up her neck as she recalled what Magician Phillips, her history of magic meddling teacher, had said about excision. Materials magic can only be performed through man-made materials, of course, but someone many, many years ago concluded that because humans begot humans, people were also man-made, and thus the dark arts began. Now, turn to page 126 in your text. Sienny ran a thumb over the shiver in her neck. Now such things were limited to campfire stories and history classes taught at Tagus Prath. Besides, Sienny had seen Magician Thane work paper magic, which meant he couldn't possibly be an excisioner. She crept along the hallway where floor met wall, grateful that the floorboards didn't squeak and give her away. She heard a tune as she neared the study. Magician Thane hummed to himself, though Sienny couldn't name the melody. It sounded foreign. He'd left the door open a crack. Sienny pushed on it lightly with her index finger, just enough to see inside. Magician Thane worked with his back to the door on the narrow table right behind his desk. A stack of standard-sized white paper sat at his right elbow, and his long indigo coat draped over the back of his chair. He continued to hum as he took a piece of paper off the stack and folded it out of Sienny's sight. What was he creating? And at one o'clock in the morning... Careful to be silent, Sienny stepped away from the door and retreated back into the dining room. She didn't like secrets, at least not ones that she wasn't in on. Perhaps she would confront Magician Thane in the morning, or perhaps she wouldn't. Sometime in the early morning hours, Magician Thane went to bed, for he was not in his study when Sienny came downstairs to raid the cupboards precisely one minute after eight o'clock. She wore her apprentice's apron and her hair in a braid, but again hadn't bothered to line her eyes or rouge her cheeks, as had recently become popular in town. There was just no reason to do so. Who did she have to impress? Dragging a chair from the dining room into the kitchen, Sienny stood on it and looked through all the cupboards, which she found to be surprisingly well stocked. Magician Thane had all the ingredients needed to make a chocolate cake, for instance, though Sienny noticed most were unopened. He had an enormous bag of rice beneath the sink, a half-eaten loaf of bread in the bread box, and eggs and an assortment of meat in the ice box, which Sienny found behind the counter, near the back door. The ice box also held a few handfuls of paper confetti. She wondered how they'd gotten in there, or if they were a part of some spell, but she merely brushed them off of the bacon and grabbed the carton of eggs, a wedge of cheddar, and a bundled stalk of fennel. She'd gotten down a frying pan and stoked the fire when she heard the strangest rasping sound coming down the stairs, along with the soft padding of paper on wood. Thinking at Jonto, she readied a spatula in her defense, but when the door to the stairs creaked open, something much shorter emerged from behind it. Sienny gaped in surprise. There, wagging its little paper tail, stood a paper dog. Dozens of pieces of paper formed its body, interlocking almost seamlessly from head to foot to tail. It had no eyes, being made of paper, but had two nostrils and a distinct mouth that opened and rasped at her in a strange sort of bark. It looked something like a lab terrier mix, its head only reaching Sienny's knee. Barking once more, the dog sprinted up to Sienny and began sniffing her shoes. With parted lips and tingles running down her back, Sienny set the spatula down by the stove, knocking the fennel stalk to the floor. She crouched and stroked the dog's head. It felt surprisingly solid beneath her fingers. 
and its paper body made her fingertips buzz almost as though she were stroking real fur. Why, hello, she said, and the dog jumped and pressed its front paws against her knees, then actually licked her with a dry paper tongue. Sienny laughed and scratched behind its ears. It panted with excitement. Wherever did you come from? The door squeaked again, announcing Magician Thane's arrival. He looked a little tired, but no worse for wear, and still wore that long indigo coat. This one won't give me hives, he said with a smile that beamed in his eyes. It's not the same, but I thought it would do for now. Wide-eyed, Sienny slowly stood, the paper dog yapping in its whispery voice and nudging her ankles with its muzzle. You made this? she asked, feeling her ribs knit over her lungs. This, this is what you were doing last night. He scratched the back of his head. Were you up? I apologize. I'm not used to having others in the house again. Again, she thought, wondering. Magician Thane seemed old enough to have had perhaps one apprentice before her, if that's what he meant. She had never bothered asking Magician Avioski about Magician Thane's previous pupils, but she didn't ask, not now. Not with this wonderful pup sniffing at her ankles. He had made this for her, because of Busy. She looked from him to the dog, then back at him. She pinched the back of her arm to keep herself from crying, for her eyes had already made the decision without her consent. Thank you, she said, perhaps too quietly. This, this means a lot to me. You didn't have to. Thank you. She grasped the spatula. Do you want some breakfast? I was about to make some. I have good timing then, Magician Thane said, momentarily distracted by something up the stairs. If you don't mind. She shook her head no. Magician Thane's eyes smiled and he vanished back up the stairs. Sienny retreated back to the icebox for more eggs, the paper dog trailing behind her, sniffing the floor as it went. She watched its paper joints move together as a whole. So that's what Magician Thane had meant. She scooped the fennel off the floor. I think I'll name you Fennel, she said to it, slipping eggs into the pocket of her apron. It may be a better cat name, but since you're not quite a real dog, well, it suits you. Fennel merely cocked his head to the side, not quite understanding. Magician Thane ate his breakfast in the study, where he laid out several books and ledgers across his tidy, cluttered desk. Sienny practiced her reading illusion until just after lunch. She could get three of the fourteen pages to form in the air around her now, and Fennel tried to chase the mouse every time it appeared. The dog provided quite the distraction, but Sienny didn't mind one bit. She even fastened Busy's old collar around Fennel's neck. It fit perfectly. Just after noon, Magician Thane called her into the library to show her the variety of papers kept on the table there, explaining the importance behind their thickness and grain. He seemed somewhat distracted and repeated himself here and there, but Sienny didn't point it out to him. She was merely relieved that the man hadn't assigned her physical labor. And while the thought of such chores didn't irk her quite the way it had yesterday, she found herself almost grateful for the lesson. What magician Thane was teaching her had started to weasel its way into that part of her that wanted to know. She found herself paying rapt attention to magician Thane's lecture, and when she recited the details of the paper back to him at the end of the lesson, she beamed under his compliment, simple as it was. That's quite accurate, he said. He peered out the window, seeing something see and he didn't behind the glass. Are you stuck on something? She finally asked as he put the sheets of paper into the wrong piles on the desk. She took them from his hands and placed them correctly, being sure to keep all the stacks straight. Hmm? Stuck on something, she repeated. You're somewhere else today. Unless he was always like that in the afternoon. Sienny had known him not quite a full day, so she had nothing to compare him to. She felt sure it wasn't madness, though. I suppose I am, he said after some thought, blinking and returning to the present. I've a lot on my mind. What with the new apprentice and all? Am I your first? Second and a half, he answered. Half? Sienny asked. How do you have half of an apprentice? The last one didn't stay his full term, he explained, without really explaining it all. Full term? Sienny thought, as a bead of fright washed down her throat. 
Was he in an accident? Quit? Laid off? Did magicians often lay off their apprentices? Sienny bit the inside of her cheek. Surely Magician Thane wouldn't fire her. The country was too desperate for paper magicians to lose any aspiring folders, and she'd already bonded paper. She hadn't considered the security of her position until now, and it made her stomach curdle. She'd worked so hard to get to where she was now, even if it was on the path to becoming a folder, not a smelter, and she still had required the luck of receiving a scholarship. For a moment she saw stars as she remembered the car crash, smelled burning onion as Mrs. Appleton had screamed at her after spilling that wine. She blinked the memories away. This apprenticeship wasn't just another job. There would be no going back were she to be laid off. She'd be bound to paper and only paper, yet not legally authorized to do anything with it. She'd be a spent magician. You look like you've eaten something sour, Magician Thane said, pulling a thick sheet of slate-colored paper from the upper right pile on the desk, just beside the telegraph. I was just thinking of what a waste it would be to bond something and then quit, is all. I agree. Well, let me show you some basic folds, unless you covered that at Prath. Sienny shook her head no. Magician Thane dropped to the floor with his board, setting the square of paper on top of it. Let's see how astute you actually are, Sienny, he said. A challenge, then. She focused. The paper magician folded the paper from corner to corner so it made a triangle. The thick parchment held the fold well. This is a half-point fold. Any fold that turns a square into a triangle. And this is a full-point fold. He folded the paper in half again. Any fold that turns a triangle into a smaller triangle. With none to spare, of course. Sienny nodded, watching quietly. He had done these two folds when making the paper bird yesterday, before turning them into a second square and then the kite. He had her repeat the folds and say their names, all while emphasizing that the paper's edges had to be completely aligned for the magic to take. Then his eyes took that faraway look again, becoming not quite as bright as they should have been. We'll start you on animation, he said, peering out the window again. It's a good place to learn the folds. I can work on this, Sienny said, if you need to do something else. Though deep in the space of wanting and knowing, she wished he'd stay and teach her. What a silly thought that was. Magician Thane nodded and stood, his long coat rustling about his legs. She felt the disappointment keenly. When he disappeared into the hallway, Fennel poked his head in and trotted right up to Sienny's hip, where he turned around three times before lying down and sleeping. Sienny had a feeling a dog made of paper couldn't get tired, though. Must have been in the enchantment. She held her half-point and full-point folds in her hands and stared out the open doorway, wondering after Magician Thane. A thread of guilt tugged between her ribs as she remembered his working late to create fennel for her, but surely that couldn't be the source of his mental absence. And she'd been on her best behavior, today at least. I ought to make it up to him, she murmured to Fennel. After all, any apprentice needs her magician's favor, or I'll be here six years instead of two. Though her mind knew the folds, she practiced them until her hands knew them too, then resigned herself to the kitchen, where she pulled spices and wines out of the cupboards and recited Pip's daring escape under her breath, testing out different voice inflections that might coax the images on the page four to life. She set one pot of water on the stove to boil for pasta and washed out last night's saucepan, setting it on the stove as well. She melted butter and added flour and milk to start a white sauce, something with lemon and garlic to go with the tied-up chicken in the ice box. When she couldn't find a lemon, she settled on tomato and basil. Everyone liked tomato and basil, and if Magician Thane kept the ingredients stocked in this house, Sienny could be confident that he liked them as well, and that they were safe to use. Sienny had noted throughout her life that people with one sort of allergy often had others. She'd already started her apprenticeship on the wrong foot. Hives would only make the other foot wrong, too. When the chicken was nearly done, the bread sliced and the sauce stirred into the penne, Magician Thane emerged from his study. "'I need to give you more assignments if you have time to do this,' he commented as Sienny peeked into the oven to check on the poultry. "'I don't think this house has smelled this good since I've lived in it.' Sienny stifled a grin at the compliment and tucked a loose strand of hair behind her ear. I wanted to thank you for everything and apologize for my behavior yesterday. 
I wasn't quite myself. This wasn't necessary, he said, his bright eyes curious. It will be done in just a minute, she said, scuttling to the cupboards to locate the green ceramic bowl she had seen earlier. It rested on the highest shelf, so Sienny climbed onto the counter to grab it. If you want to sit down, I set the table already. Magician Thane smiled or did something between a smirk and a smile. It touched both eyes and lips. All right. Thank you. But then I'm assigning you reading material and giving you 200 sheets of paper to fold. Sienny dumped the pasta into the ceramic bowl and set it on the fir table first, then carefully transferred the chicken and roasted vegetables to the broad plate. Magician Thane had no serving trays, and set that in front of Magician Thane. He said nothing, but the arch of his eyebrows told her he was impressed. At least Sienny hoped that's what it meant. It could have also meant that the magician had been saving that chicken for something else and noted that Sienny had cooked it without permission. If that were the case, hopefully the taste would smooth out any hard feelings. Sienny sat on her chair on the other side of the square table, then stood up again and asked, Do you know how to carve a bird? I believe Jonto does. Sienny paled. She spied mirth in his eyes. Was that a joke? Regardless, she picked up the fork and knife and sliced into the chicken herself. Gathering a few teaspoons of courage, she asked, I was also wondering if my apprenticeship included a stipend of some sort, or a wage. Magician Thane laughed. Light laughter that didn't come from the chest or the throat, but somewhere in between. Ah, I understand. The plot thickens. Sienny flushed. No, what I said earlier was sincere, really. But people should talk over dinner, especially if they're going to live in the same house, and I thought my wages would be a good place to start, is all. The school board decides your stipend, Magician Thane said, scooping up some tomato basil pasta onto his plate. So yes, you have one. I believe it's ten pounds a month, plus anything else I decide to pay you on the side. Ten pounds? She focused on loading her own plate to hide her wide eyes. More than she had thought. She could send half of that home every month, should she be frugal. She glanced back to the paper magician. And what will you pay me on the side? Magician Thane held his fork loosely in his hand. I'll not starve you, if that's your worry. Sienny considered his tuna and rice and thought to make a point on the note of starving, but she bit back her tongue and took her seat. The paper magician made no move to say grace, and she seldom did, so she cut herself a morsel of chicken, watching him from the corner of her eye. He stabbed his fork into two pieces of pasta and raised them to his lips. He tasted them, chewing, and his eyes brightened just a bit more. "'I'd say, Sienny,' he said after swallowing. "'Had I not been present for the lessons, I'd think you'd found a way to enchant pasta.' Sienny smiled. "'You like it?' He nodded, scooping up another bite. "'It tastes just as good as it smells.' That's a sign of a well-rounded person. I should congratulate you. On my person or my pasta? Light danced in his eyes. He didn't answer. Sienny tasted her chicken, relieved it wasn't too dry. Three bites into her own dinner, Magician Thane said, Oldest of four. Two sisters, one brother, Sienny replied. Do you have a large family? You seem like someone who's suffered through a great deal of sisters. I've suffered through a great many people but none of them sisters. I'm an only child. That explains a few things, Sienny thought. A few seconds of silence passed between chewing bites. Not wanting the time to grow long, Sienny asked, When do you get groceries? He glanced at her. When I run out, I suppose. Groceries are my most dreaded chore. Why? He lowered his fork and leaned his chin onto his hand, elbow on the table edge. They require going into the city, he stated, and it's hot out besides. Sienny paused as she cut into the next morsel of chicken. Do you freckle? He laughed. Now there's a conversation turn. I mean, Sienny began, I could understand not going outside if you freckle. She glanced at her hands, spotted with freckles of her own. They had a tendency to cover every bit of skin exposed to the sun between March and October. I don't freckle, he said. She must have been frowning at her hands, for he added, And there's nothing wrong with freckles, Sienny. Heaven forbid you look like everyone else in this place. Sienny smiled and shoved some pasta into her mouth to keep the grin contained. And since you have so much extra time, Magician Thane said, your first quiz will be tomorrow morning. <laughs>